We are sevens or sevens. Are you working or not working? So, so, so when we say somebody is unemployed, it means that are sevens. The person is not working. My understanding of the EFF relative to its relationship with the agency is that don't partner with the agency in a coalition. Welcome back to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, Mike Sham. Wonderful to have you with us. And uh, today we've got our favorite analyst, Mr. Sandile Swana, making a comeback to the State of the Nation. We haven't seen him in a little while. We haven't seen you in 2024. Welcome back to the State of the Nation, Sandile. Good to have you back. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, may it be a good year, 2024. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. We know, uh, we know because it's an election year. And we know that election season has started, um, and that is when uh, generally the president or somebody in the ANC blames opposition countries for wanting regime change. So that one's already kicked off, where um, Fakile Mbalula said he saw Razum Zanzi posters, which must mean that international countries that are angry at South Africa taking Israel to the ICJ or want regi regime change. That's when you know it's election season, right? And this, the other part uh, and more of a talking point is um, when uh, the president turns his state of the nation talk into less about the state of the nation and more as an election speech. What did you make of his performance at, uh, at his state of the nation? You know, uh, uh, Mike, uh, there is something that uh, I picked up uh, yesterday. In fact, uh, I was listening to a discussion between Sizu Mpofu and uh, J.J. Taban. And, and I took it seriously because J.J. Taban is a student of communications. And he made something that I think a lot, he said something that a lot of us have not paid attention to as a discipline that the state of the nation address should be saying what is the state of the nation now. In other words, it should be ideally be almost like you going for your annual checkup. Yeah. Uh, Mike, this is your height, this is your weight, uh, this is the whatever the heart rate, whatever they measure when mm -hmm. they do this checkup. Thing. But to say this is your baseline right now, this is where you are. Then we can discuss to say, in your previous uh, checkup when you were last year, what did you look like? But what the important thing is, truthfully, what do you look like? When you say something is in a state, it means you are taking a photograph of that mm -hmm. thing at that point in time. And a lot of the time, the movement or lack of movement is often the discussion that of that place, rather than taking the actual photograph. So I, I found that to be quite interesting. The, the State of the Nation uh, addressed by uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, to me, uh, was going to be a problematic one in the sense that the fellow has got six months because what he normally does is to promise things that he's going to do. For instance, there were high-speed trains in the other one. There were smart cities that he never did, he never brought about. But now what do you say if you are left with six months in office? Uh, what realistically can you do, especially uh, where by all measures and all counts, uh, since the Bulugwane Conference of the African National Congress and Jacob Zuma eventually took over, there's been a downward spiral, both in terms of the electoral support of the ANC and decline of the economy, worsening of the crime rate and collapse of governance systems in the country. But all of that that Jacob Zuma did accelerated during and worsened during the, the, the Ramaphosa era. In fact, Ramaphosa put the country into reverse gear and pressed the accelerator. He put us into accelerated retrogression. So the speech was going to be a hoodwinking type of speech. He had to pull something fast and confuse the nation as to what is the true picture today and what has it done to the nation, especially the damage that he has done. So he tried to woodwink us with a 30-year story. He came up with a 30-year story. But if you listen to some of the people from the Statistician General's Office and people of the kind, they will show you that from 2011, the retrogression, the 
movement backwards, the erosion of any benefits that had accrued from 1994 started happening. So a lot of the things that were achieved under the Mbeki regime has since been neutralized. They are no longer relevant. So actually, other than getting rid of apartheid, and I'm one of those people who are very happy that I don't have a police officer asking me for a pass book, a reference book. I'm happy about that. But I expected more. Uh, today you see a black man, people say black men, the black men are generally short. And uh, uh, what it is that were not generally short in stature was stunted because of malnutrition that we've been suffering, uh, that black children have been suffering. Stunting is commonplace. So the ANC has unleashed malnutrition uh, over the black population. Uh, over this period, and that malnutrition had was there under apartheid, and they have not been able to address it now under this, and the collapse of black families. These issues are being referenced, but the state of the nation, if we're to talk about it, is dire. And Ramaphosa wanted to sugarcoat it, and he introduced this Tinswalo thing, which became a big controversy. Yeah. And um, obviously, uh, you referenced JJ Tabani and to everybody that... He's going to be on the show in the next couple of episodes. So uh, well done, Sizwe, in beating me to the punch. But uh, JJ is scheduled to be here soon. Um, so back to the state of the nation. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I think he has realized, because in essence, there's been, there's been two eras of the ANC. There's first 15 years and the last 15 years. Uh, the first 15 years is a story of gro economic growth, uh, international relevance, uh, the last 15 years has just been steep decline. Um, and there are many issues. And obviously, he, he, other than saying, for example, probably the only thing he said is, we're going to phase out um, load shedding, whether you believe it or not is a separate issue. But nothing was said about, uh, about for example, the, the, the dreadful crime situation that we have in South Africa or any solution to fix it. Um, and the, there's... Definitely, you know, what, what I found most distressing was that there wasn't one mention of taxpayers that are paying for all of this. Not one acknowledgement that, you know, South Africa still, certainly half of us get up in the morning and actually do our best to keep an economy going. And you do want to pat on the head every now and again for that. But also, you know, and that, that sort of plays into unemployment, which is sitting at about 50%. Now, I know you've... Uh, um, wanted to talk about uh, unemployment and the crisis. Yes, uh, I, I think, uh, Mike, we've got to really challenge the leaders in South Africa to uh, to just take a step back and, and look at what it is that is actually going on with unemployment. I'm, I'm not picking on the DA, but they've published this weekend that they they are going to create two million jobs in in five years. Now, basic economics will tell you that the number is wrong, right? Uh, this is why I am saying the number is wrong, and and this is the, there's a number I want to give to all the political parties because nobody is going to be the government of South Africa now. We're going into coalition yeah. government, so. The DA is just putting a number there that must be discussed. So I might as well put my own. Uh, so this is the situation. The current, let's say for the sake of this discussion, the current backlog of unemployment is 12 million people who don't have jobs. Then every year you have 600 new entrants into the job market. So if you didn't create brand new jobs, your unemployment would then increase to 12.6 million in a year, in 12 months' time. So if you say you are going to create, in five years, you are going to create uh, 2 million jobs, that's 400,000 jobs per year. But new entrants alone are actually 600,000. So you are adding to the backlog 200,000 per year. So the backlog is going to escalate. So my view is that when you want to talk about the, the issue of unemployment, strictly just looking at the labor market this time, and we'll go further to the other side of this thing, uh, is that you need to decide, am I going to reduce the backlog by a million per year, which means it will take 12, 12 years to, to get to zero? Or 
can I be more aggressive? So I said, can we then talk maybe about 1.7 at least? But if it was me, I would have said 2 million a year, not mm -hmm. 2 million every um in five years. Then, then basically, by the time the DA comes out of office, the unemployment situation will be worse mm. if we accept what they are proposing. So I am then proposing that in the same manner that I rejected Sir Ramaphosa's 275,000 jobs, we must reject the DA's 2 million jobs because it has got no bearing on the objective facts on the ground. Now, another side of the story Simple side, philosophical, we can have this as a kitchen discussion in the combis and say this. We're talking about unemployment in, in the Kosa language, my language, when you are being asked about this thing, we are servants, our servants, are you working or not working? So, so, so when we say somebody is unemployed, it means like our servants, the person is not working. Now, my view is to translate that into English and to economics. Can we get the population productive, right? Maybe we are not just talking about jobs now. We're talking about getting the population productive and adding value to the nation. And part of what we've now neglected completely and actually insulted and despised is the fact that all great nations are built by family businesses. Families that work, children that work, adults that work, families that simply work and add value every day. And the idea of a family business is often frowned upon. So if, for instance, it, people discover that Sandy Leswana is working for a family business, they say, such a bright guy, what is he doing in small business? Why is he not at Anglo-American or Pick and Pay or Sassol? Why is he not taking a big position and doing the real thing? But the real thing should be getting my children, my grandchildren, my wife and I to work at value and be financially and economically independent. And that is not receiving attention. Mm. If you look at Germany, for instance, there are so many community banks that are funding local entrepreneurs and local entrepreneurs are the artisans that are trained in the local colleges. Guys can do fancy stuff, mm. but they learn the skills locally in the local colleges and so on. So I want to say, can we then talk about getting South Africa to work? Yeah. Now, you know, you're talking about an issue very, very close to my heart, you know, coming out of a nice Lebanese uh, sort of trading family. Um, I've never, for a brief moment, I worked in corporate, but generally speaking, my whole life has been in small business and family-owned businesses. Now, of course, you can't have family-owned businesses and external shareholders. By definition, the family will own the shares of those family businesses. Yes, they do grow, they do become proper companies, and they may have shareholders. But obviously, uh, in South Africa, some of our policies, uh, you must understand that the ANC have got, a, have got the same lack of understanding of businesses that the National Party had. There's no difference. And they also didn't understand family-owned businesses. But uh, how would you reconcile the growth of family-owned businesses with a nat national prescription on who, should, who shareholders in your company should be? Uh Mike, I, I think there are different types of, of, of uh, personalities. Let's, let's start there. You look at a family man, Raymond Ekamen, the family businessman, Raymond Ekamen, and you look at how he has structured his pick-and-pay business. So when we talk about family-owned businesses, uh, you know, you could be talking about Siemens, you could be talking about Volkswagen, you could be talking about Mike's Corner Shop. Mm. Uh, so the the idea is is culturally different to me, and I'll come to your issue, your direct issue, is that what do we see the home is, as and what do we see the family as? I am saying that your civilization and your economy must start in the home. Uh, and it must continue in the home. Uh, for instance, scientists already will tell you that we shouldn't be sending our parents to old age homes and so on and so forth. So, so the, the concept of a home and a family needs to be changed so that the welfare of people actually improves. So the home 
has got a whole lot of services. The family has got a whole lot of services that it should be delivering. Now, let's then turn it differently. For whatever reason, you and I work together and we like working together. By South African standards, you are a so-called white, I'm a so-called black. Somebody decided that, that there's going to be population registration in 1952. And some of you fell for that. So, so some of you believe you are white, actually. Some of us believe we are black. But it was something that was invented by certain people. But we are here. You are sitting there on that side of the table. I'm on this side. Voluntarily, we are cooperating. We are creating value. So we must not then... Uh, politicians can say what they want to say about many things. But we must not be able to say, get to a point, because there's another dangerous side to this discussion, where somebody will say, I don't want blacks in my business because of PE, this, that, and the other. But for whatever reason, we want to be with each other. You and I, Mike and Sandile, want to be with each other. And some people will tell us that Sandile, you are black, Mike, you are white. But we are here creating value right now, and we've done it before. So I am saying that, can we forget about these many different things? I agree that in any country, whether you are in Germany or in any other nation, empower your people and create opportunities for entrepreneurship. Now, at a different time, based on the level of sophistication and development, people will come with crazy ideas. Fervut came up with a crazy idea of apartheid, but he thought that he was going to empower people. Uh, Africaners, white Africaners, and all that sort of thing. But he did say it was going to cost somebody else some, something. So we need to be able, as we are doing now, to say here are more robust and more creative ideas. And, and a family, for instance, in my family, my relatives, some of them are Indians, some of them are Arabs, right? Some of them are white Americans, and so on and so forth. Some are Portuguese, my own relatives. So when I talk about a family, Yes. It's a whole lot of things yeah. that are mixed up in there. Yeah, well, well, I suppose what I'm referring to here most of all is, is when you have, if we want the economy to grow, which we obviously need, is you got to cut back on the, on the bureaucracy. And, you know, you, we, this, this to me is the most unnecessary bureaucratic nonsense because we would, as you say, we would be working happily and I don't employ black people, and, and on the population registration question, the apartheid government had a real problem when Lebanese people started to come to this country as to what you were because it was European and non-European, and yeah, these people come from outside of Europe. Um, so, you know, it, it does create questions, and it creates ridiculous bureaucracy. And I don't understand why in South Africa we want to put ourselves under that pressure, because as you mentioned, in countries from Korea, Japan, uh, the, many places in Europe, in fact, largely just about every place except for the United Kingdom, uh, has a base of family-owned businesses. But family-owned businesses can't, will have a problem you know, complying with some of the, the bureaucracy. You, you must remember that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I love peanut butter, for instance. Uh, so... I, I've stopped eating peanut butter for a period now because there's a recall on peanut yeah. butter. I don't, now I don't know which one is good, which one is poisonous. So I said, let me stop it. But there's an issue there, which is standards, which means that everything that is done must eventually comply with standards. And nobody must have an excuse of not complying with standards. But standards must also have criteria of being relevant, being useful and fairness and so on. There must be criteria of standards. So when people say register a company in this way, whether the company is a CC, a PTY, LTD or a public company, uh, register it in this way, keep the books in this way and so on and so forth. It's also to safeguard other people as well. So for instance, uh, I mean, I buy a lot of stuff on the internet uh, from companies that... I, I don't know. I mean, it's just a click. But by God's grace, I've never lost money on the internet. But somebody at the back of this whole thing needs to make sure that nobody's swindling anybody. Yes. So, 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 so some of this thing that ends up being called bu bureaucracy can be just bureaucracy. 
But we cannot have business that is not regulated, uh, that is not ha- that does not have standards. But you, as a local councillor, as a local mayor, because that's what, one of the important things that you must not be a mayor because you are an idiot, right? Uh, a mayor must be a very competent person. A councillor, a ward councillor must be a very competent person. So that when these entrepreneurs are starting these businesses in your local environment and they need assistance to comply with SABS standards, there are certain aspects of SARS, there's this. You have all the tools at your disposal to actually intervene immediately and make their lives easy. And that you'll right. find in any country, in any economy in the world. Where, where you have the correct politicians and administrators in place. For instance... I was looking at this thing when I told you this morning that I am very worried about this whole discussion about unemployment. For instance, uh, you created all of this here out of your mind. Call it, call it crazy stuff, whatever you want to call it, but these things spark in your mind and you mm-hmm. create them. And I'm the same in my own life. right? So, now imagine this. I come up with something totally new. For instance, now, and and, and I mean, I'm using an already old story. Let's say now I wanted to start a very high quality solar business, solar energy business. Shouldn't I be able to say to somebody, whether it's my ward council or somebody, that I'm starting to to this business, I think I'm going to need these skills and I can give it to the councillor. And the councillor can talk to the FET college, whoever it is and whoever they need to talk to, and I can have those skills. Bear in mind that there are countries that are already short of labor, as we speak here. They are kind of, we are battling with people uh, who have no jobs. In other countries, they are battling with, they've got too many businesses that are short of labor. Yeah. So their entrepreneurs have a serious problem. When you want to start a business, Uh, You you have a serious question, Guti, where am I going to find people who are going to work in this business? And I am saying that those are some of the questions that need to be answered ahead of time. That can we then understand that, first of all, we are creating this explosive culture of entrepreneurship that is demanding labor. But you have people in charge of the state and our educational and training systems who are competently able to close that gap on short notice. And that is lacking in South Africa. Both sides are lacking. And to be, if you want to be insulted in this country, you want to be disrespected, you become an entrepreneur. Mm, yes. And I think that uh, certainly uh, it's, a, it's a bugbear of mine is that the psychology of it all, um, you know, the, this idea that you're going to go wake up in the morning and I have to tell you, the, one of the smartest people I know, that you're disadvantaged, I think is a terrible psych- psychological blow. Do you know what I mean? There's history. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, we've got to at some point um, start looking forward, one would imagine, or else we're never going to solve these problems. No, you see, it's I, I look at it differently, right? Uh, I look at it differently. Um, you know, for instance, um, uh, 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 the, the way you develop youth, Right. It doesn't matter whether the youth is born in the village of Luzupu in Lusigisigi or born in Sandhurst. The the talent, their talent must not be compromised. Right? So that talent must be developed fully, regardless of geographic location. Right? And I'm not even talking about skin color this time, because I think this thing about skin color can confuse the issue. Yeah. Right? So if you're running a proper nation. You are not going to pitch up when Bafana Bafana has won the, the, the bronze medal uh, at the AFCON Cup. And I can say it for any discipline of sport. And then you are the minister of sport. You pitch up there. On that day, they see you for the first time. They've never seen you. You don't know where these kids went to school, how they got their first football to kick, all that, you know, by chance, they happen to be there by chance. The state never put nothing into their development. Others win international music awards. I hear that there's a guy who won a UFC or some yeah. other fighting cup and what have you. Others win the Springboks, uh, what they call this Rugby World Cup and what have you. And others win science and technology awards. Kids that the ministers 
have no clue. The ruling party doesn't even know. One year, I'll make an example, because I was very involved in sport in my younger times, my younger years. Uh, my wife had a cousin who was studying at the University of Western Cape, and she made the dean's list. This girl made the dean's list in 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 sports uh, sports administration and all that the, the sports degree that she was doing. There. She was on the dean's list, top student. I went to see the guy here who was the the CEO of our sports uh, body nationally. And I discovered that he doesn't even know who the top sports students are in the different universities. He doesn't even know how many of the top students are totally unemployed. Right? Some of the top students in sport, and, and the same can apply that you can be the Minister of Minerals and Energy. You, that year, you don't even know who the top mining engineering student is. And you say you are running the, the, the mining industry in this country. You don't even know where the talent of future mining engineers is going to come from. The pipeline, where is it going to come from? The guys who are still at seven years old, how many of them are likely to be mining engineers? So we are wandering around the world, around South Africa. We say we're leading this nation. We're not leading this nation. We're walking in front of it. And we have to keep looking back whether they are also walking behind us. Because people who are walking behind you are not necessarily following you. They're just walking behind you and you're walking in front of them. And this country is in a mindless drift mm. when it comes to developing its a, a, a most important resource. And I'll make the statement about two nations, Japan and Israel. And I'm not a fan of the, the, the violence that is going on in Israel in any form. But when you look at Japan, you look at the natural resources they've got. They've got nothing. Mm. So what is their mind? It's the, the minds of their children. So all the success you see in, in Japan, they are mining the minds of their children. All the cars, the Toyota vehicles, which is the best in the world, the Nissan, the Sony, everything, top technology in the world, they mine it out of their yeah, children's minds. Israel is the same. They've got nothing on the ground. What do they have? Children. And they develop. And South Africa is not doing that. And there are consequences of extreme poverty that we're facing because we don't mind our children. Yeah, look, uh, certainly on that score, a relevant uh, example to, to, uh, that comes to my mind is Vietnam. That have now 40% of all of their uh, tertiary education students are in STEM disciplines, right? They are busy eating China's lunch. Right, because China have got skill level here and Vietnam has taken it to a level beyond and they're busy getting all of the outsourced work that's leaving China now. Much of it is going to Vietnam. So, yeah, it certainly can happen where a state steps in and a bit of, uh, a bit of um, understanding of the way the world works. You don't have so many BA students because there's a limit to the value they're going to add. Right, that's not to say that a BA student won't add value, but you can be sure, rest assured that you're probably better off with a thousand engineering students than you are with a thousand Bachelor of Arts students, one would imagine. You see, the, 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 um, it's, it's a cultural thing, right? It's a cultural thing. So, uh, for instance, we talk about BA students. Uh, you look at what Shakespeare has done to the UK. Shakespeare's books are all over the world. They continue to bear fruit and royalties every day, 24 hours a day. So, uh, look at Michael Jackson's music. You know, uh, I think when I was checking uh, for another article I wrote, I think he's making about uh, 47 million a year on royalties on that music. That's an arts, uh, uh, arts uh, student, if you want to call mm. it the practitioner. So the issue here is 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 not uh, uh, the disciplines themselves. Uh, it is the culture that you create. Mm. So when you create children, you raise children who are creators, who are innovators, who are inventors. 
uh, that culture alone also encourages people to study things that they want, that then uh, uh, advance their creativity, if you understand what I mean. So if my creativity is going to make me need me to understand physics better, as an example, or IT a little bit better and so on, that energy that is already on the inside of me, uh, bubbling on the inside of me as a creator, forces me itself automatically to study the right things that are helping me to go there. So to me, uh, uh, things like a national philosophy, what do we believe? For instance, you know, uh, why do these youngsters not vote? Right? I'll put something cruel, a st very cruel statement, that they think somebody got to do something for them. Yeah. Right? Um, so we need to create youngsters who say, if something is missing, if there is no bridge in my village, what is it that I can think of that can cause that bridge to be there? Can I even invent the bridge? Uh, so when you see something missing, you see yourself as an agent and a resource to resolve that problem. That's a different philosophy. Then that forces you to learn. You know, for instance, I keep chicken where I stay. I keep chicken. But I had to go to YouTube and learn and study and go over there and ask questions and learn and teach myself things and so on and so forth. But coming to your point about Vietnam, you see, this thing is not as lengthy and as tedious as all that. Let's take an example. When I came to Vitz to, as a student for the first time, I came from Umtata, I came from St. John's College. Umtata was a science student. And I wanted to study computers, but I had not worked on a computer in my life before. But I knew that I wanted to get into electronics. So everything I knew about electronics and computers was something I'd read either in a journal or a book. Never touched it. But within three years, I was a software engineer. Coming from Umtada to Johannesburg, three years later, I'm a software engineer. Right? Now, three years is not a hell of a long time. And if you keep doing that, if you take the first, first group of students, the next year you take another one, next year you take... If you do that just for 10 years, can you imagine what happens to your population? Mm. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the disservice, uh, Mike, that has been done to this country um, is that the, as a percentage of the black population, as a percentage of the black population, the number of graduates, university graduates, has declined sixfold since 1994. So the black population has got less graduates today to sustain it than it had in 1994. Now that speaks to social structure. And that's the one thing that you'll never hear. I don't think I've ever really heard a, any of our presidents or any politician address in South Africa. You mentioned earlier about family structure family businesses, etc. that usually emerges from a strong social structure. Uh, that seems to be a field that certainly successive ANC governments won't talk about, which is the black social structure. What's your feeling there? You see, um, in fact, I must give credit to someone, but I, I think that is weak. Uh, Wallace Sirot, one of the comrades is called Wallace Sirot, one of the top ANC intellectuals, but I think he's very weak. Uh, when I say weak, it means this is not the person who sways ANC policy. Mm. But I went to listen to him by whatever chance I, I happened to be there. I think it was at Freedom Park at some place. And he mentioned the that one of the most underutilized entities is the extended family in the African community. And uh, my view is that you can say what you like about the so-called Westerners. I mean, you uh, Lebanese come from Asia, so we can say what we want to say about uh, Westerners. Uh, but if you want people who can tell you a lot, uh, meet an Englishman, you'll be surprised that he can tell you 700 years of his family history. Uh, and you meet an African, a South African African, and you ask him to do the same and he won't. And we say we are people who are very focused on our ancestors and this and the other, and it's a haphazard thing. 
and the extended family and the crea systematic creation of that family as a center of development, which was there before, by the way, which was there before. Then as we, and then when the ANC goes into exile, comes back from exile, they come up with all sorts of half-cooked ideas that they've learned in England. Some were staying in flats in London. Others were staying in flats in Chicago. They come with hamburgers and other things. There is no understanding of African culture. But culture is the collection of the things that have made the people successful. And language is the library where those things are given text. So something that your, your culture has never experienced, has never worked with, you will not have a word for it. When you encounter it for the first time or you discover it or innovate it or invent it, that's when you give a word for it. So by learning your language, I learn what you know. Everything you know is in your language. And what is in your language is in your culture. And culture should be made up of only successful things that have kept you alive and have made your people to prosper. So now, when you talk about structure, structure is not structure for the sake of structure. It is structure for a purpose, right? So there's a lot of things that I benefited by staying with my grandfather and my grandmother as a youngster. And they are permanently embedded in me. And fortunately, I stayed with him before the age of seven. So those doctrines and practices that my grandfather had are established in me till today. So, so there's a lot that a child must learn from his grandparents. There's a lot that he must learn from his parents. Then the outside teachers, the aunties, the uncles. When you fall on evil days, the social security you should have is your extended family. They should be there and cover the gap. That is the African way and all successful people. Ask any Indian. The Indians are running the most successful families in South Africa today. But there are no people who master the extended family more than any other group here. And the businesses, big, big businesses, they are run them by the family. So the, every development. You know, in an Indian family, you can find six doctors, eight CAs. Uh, because they make it a business, their own business, and one teaches the other, the younger teaches, uh, and so on. They pass it among each other. So you find that when he leaves the office, if he's a CA, he's got a problem, he doesn't know how to solve. He will be meeting with his uncles and cousins later on and say, no, this is the solution. When he comes back in the morning, he's a genius, but he got it at home. Yeah. Which sort of leads us, I know we've, uh, we've spoken a lot about the, the outskirts. We do have an election coming up. Um, it's not going very well for the country is not in a good place. We, you know, that this, we don't have to belabor the, the woes of South Africa and election season has kicked off and suddenly the waters are quite unclear because even when you and I uh, did a live event at the end of, uh, of the year, there had been, there was rumors, but MK hadn't been in, unleashed on us. That's some quanto we see where Jacob Zuma's party. There's been a whole lot of other new parties that have come into the game. Uh, what, do you, what, what are you starting to see for elections 2024? I know this is fluid and it updates all the time. Where are you standing at the moment on the election? Do you think, uh, like Cyril says, the ANC is going to get over 50%? Uh, let's start there. Let's Where, start there. Let's yeah. start there. I, I think that there is no body who's going to get 50%. I think... Any party that gets above 40% will be fortunate. Let's just start there. I think that they, and, and the DA, by the way, are a genius at this. I think the DA was probably one of the first parties to realize that actually the business of winning 51% is over. It's not mm. going to happen. So the DA, I don't see them as a party that has been trying to win over the masses in full. But so, 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 so the issue of whether it's Zuma or Sir Ramaphosa running around, I mean, Zuma has said they are going to win two thirds yeah. majority uh, and, and Cyril 51%. Uh, and fortunately, the DA didn't say anything like that. And the DA, I mean, they mentioned it subtly in their manifesto speeches that, uh, you know, they are going to be the anchor tenant, uh, which is another arrogant statement, by the way, uh, anchor tenant in a coalition. Uh, because this idea, because the ANC and the, and the DA had this idea of being somebody's boss and uh, not working with equal partners. They, they want to be the boss of some, some ended. So uh, 
I mean, I was reading a story I do from time to time. I, for whatever reason, I get attracted to the Netherlands and, and more especially the agricultural sector. So the party of farmers in the Netherlands, uh, I was reading headlines a little while back that hey, they won the, the election, they dominated the election. And it's a headline. But when you look at the percentage they got was 31%. But they are regarded as a giant, a political giant, a 31%. And I think South Africa is headed in the, in the direction where a political giant is probably between 20 and 45 percent. But I think it's going to be very difficult for a party in the future to get above 40 percent. Okay, so let's say, uh, so you're looking at, let's say, the ANC being somewhere around that 40 percent mm. level. Um, those votes go somewhere. The difference between uh, the the fifteen percent or sixteen percent they would have lost from the last election. Uh, what are you seeing outside of the ANC, and then we'll go into coalitions next. So, you know, if I, I, if I I think there are straightforward answers. Mm. Uh, there are straightforward answers in KZN. Votes are going to be lost from the ANC into IFP and into Mkondosi. No question about that. Uh, obviously the the EFF sees this as an opportunity, uh, 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 but it's not an easy opportunity for them either. So, so in KZN, that's what you have. Uh, here in Gauteng, Gauteng is, is a cosmopolitan uh, province, right? Uh, uh, in other words, people like uh, Action SA are very relevant here, you know. Uh, and and, and you, in Gauteng, you cannot be quickly be, when you talk for instance about action SA, you are not going to say action SA is going to just go and pull black voters or white voters or stuff. So people in Houten are exciting in that sense. So when they move away from the ANC, so the IFPs of this world, the action SAs, the EFFs are going to start uh, gaining in Houten. I expect the ANC to lose Houten. Uh, to lose the majority in Gauteng. I think it's already, when you look at the statistics of the metros, where the population is highest, clearly they've lost the majority. So so these other parties, let alone the fact that these parties, which is the next discussion, I suppose, from your point of view, as to how they then form themselves into coalition is another discussion. But gaining those votes, they are going to gain them. And, and I expect Action SA, if Mashaba holds a sober line, uh, they are going to gain a lot of votes in Gauteng. But again, you have other forces now emerging. And, and I don't know how well they organize they are. To me, it might be an emotional statement, but I think a guy like Bongani Baloi deserves a lot of votes, uh, a respectable vote. Uh, I don't know my money strategy if it is working in the market, uh, but he's a very clever guy with a track record. Uh, and here in Gauteng, that could be a market that could receive him. Uh, Songe Zozibi is another candidate that could receive uh, uh, votes in Gauteng. And Gauteng matters, by the way. I mean, there's no province as big as Gauteng in terms of population and voters. So Western Cape, again, is shifting. And I don't think the DA is worried. They, they see themselves as an anchor ten a tenant. Uh, I think they are realizing that they are not going to hold on to the majority of the Western Cape for too long. Uh, uh, the, the rural areas uh, outside of the city of Cape Town are shifting loyalties uh, and, and local politicians are gaining momentum and so on and so forth. So so it's going to shift. The DA and the ANC are, are shifting downwards in my judgment. Yeah. Uh, they're starting to look old-fashioned and out of touch yeah. in many ways. And obviously, we watch it closely and I'll give you my, my view on that in a minute. But uh, let's just go back to the first part. You mentioned KZN with um, Konto with Seaswear that's going to come there and definitely take some votes away from the ANC and the IFP. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like shaping up to be 25% uh, ANC, 25% possibly MK, 25% possibly IFP. IFP. Mm -hmm. The question that I want to put to you just on KZN and, and especially with regards to Konto with Seaswear, it would I would imagine... There is nowhere else for Zuma to go but to coalesce with the ANC. I'm starting to wonder if this, if Zuma isn't the best thing that happened to the, the ANC, you know, him starting this party. Because, you know, he's just really, what is he doing it for? He's doing it for himself. In actual fact, there might be a bigger mission in, in this, and that is to give 
this view that there's something that, that represents a part of the ANC that people still like, i.e. Zuma. Instead of him going on the stump trail for the ANC, which he knows is compromised, start your own party, and then after the election, throw your lot in with the ANC anyway. Yes. Uh, what is interesting from a, a statistical perspective on that note uh, is that in a simplistic way of thinking, uh, and, and I don't know who's their statistical advisor, but uh, in, a, in a simplistic way of thinking, you would say if there is a, a reform movement of the ANC led by Zuma, uh, it would attract votes, and those votes would be big enough if combined with Cyril Ramaphosa's ANC to get the 51% or even the two-thirds majority. Now, the problem with that, you know, that we learned uh, in marketing and, and sales was that you don't want a bigger share of a shrinking market, generally speaking. Uh, 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 if the market itself is shrinking and you want to keep getting a bigger share of a shrinking market, you could be headed for a problem. So the the governance and leadership of both Cyril Ramaphosa and Jacob Zuma since the Pulukwane conference has been a steep decline in, so, in support. So the ANC has been not winning more votes, although we were told that if you remove Tabombeki and you put Jacob Zuma, the votes will go up. Tabombeki was already at 70%. Immediately they removed Tabombeki, the votes went down and they've been going down ever since. And they've lost the majority to 45% as we speak today. So now you need to then account to say, if you do this gimmick that Zuma is doing, in terms of the actual numbers, for instance, that 45%, what is he going to do to that 45% to get it above 51? And, and what are the mechanics of that? What are the mechanics? Because when he came in, he actually reduced the votes. And he worked two terms with Cyril and they reduced the votes together. And Cyril worked on his own and he reduced the votes uh, further. So these two faces are now coming to the market the ANC market, and saying we want votes back to Mbeki's level. And there's no history for that in statistics. There's no support for that. So if Zuma, relative to all of us, is a Trojan horse that wants to bring the ANC back to make us suffer, I think they might be in for a big surprise. Uh, then the other parties that might have some form of friendship with the ANC, let's say ATM as an example, or, or, or any good. other, any or other, or, or good, or any other, for any different reasons. And, and remember, there's also opportunism in this. Yes. So the thing which the EFF, uh, some people didn't understand the EFF, but my understanding of the EFF relative to its relationship with the ANC is that don't partner with the ANC in a coalition. You can give them a, a, an opportunity to govern, but don't be held accountable for what they do. There's a reason for that. In that, you, you don't want to, the ANC, when it is drowning, to hold on to you. Right? So, the danger of partnering with the ANC, which has been failing consistently for a long time, is that if you are too close to them, when they really start drowning now, they are going to go down with you. Mm -hmm. So, Anybody who wants to form a coalition with the ANC has got the danger that how close are you and how tight are you with them that when they lose all power and faint in the water and they have no control of their own body anymore, are you able to carry them? Can you carry them sustainably? And remember that once you form that coalition on day one, you are dealing with an, an unrehabilitated drug addict. They are addicted to corruption. So every time they enter the office, they want to walk straight to the cash register. And they are your partner. That is what you've got to cut against. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've mentioned that in an interview that I've done with Gaten McKenzie because the Patriotic Alliance, he's, he's trying a tactic, which are, it's interesting. He keeps on coalescing with the ANC and blaming the DA. So he says, I'm only doing this because I want to be with the DA, but the DA are nasty to me. 
in, I think that's to try, like I said, if it's a magician's trick where you're sort of saying, look there, look there, and meantime, the action's happening here. He is in power with the ANC, but he wants to make out that it's the DA's fault, right? And hope that the voters don't, don't tag him for the ANC's failures or his coalition's failures, which they, uh, you should I, take. I, I think that Gaten McKenzie still needs to be challenged on a number of fronts. Yeah. Uh, you are probably very polite in, in, in your engagement with him. Very, very polite. Because what actually, if I were to interpret what you are saying my own way, is, is that there's a measure of dishonesty. It, absolutely. Right? It is a criminal <laughs> enterprise. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and secondly, if we were to take Gaten McKenzie back to where our original discussion about the structure of society and the family and what have you, uh, and there's a section of our community, I mean, the DA, in commenting on the statistics in South Africa, crime statistics, they said 80% of gang crime, organized crime, if you want to call it that, comes from the Western Cape. And if we were to dig deeper in the Western Cape from the so-called colored communities, that's where the, the capital of gangsterism is at. Now, I have reservations about culturally, and, and Gaydon McKenzie needs to deal with this, and a lot of other people need to deal with this, that in those communities that have got a crime problem, and bear in mind I was born in Soweto, uh, we need to, I've never been imprisoned for a crime. I've never served a prison sentence for any crime in my life. Then, a story comes along that, guys, there's a second chance. I am saying, can you take the first chance as a black kid? Can you take the first chance? Just go to school, go to technical college, get your trade, and get a job, get a wife, run a proper family. Don't go and say, I got a 35-year life sentence, and I was able to reform in prison, and I met the Lord, and I got born again, and all this other thing. Why don't you go straight for success? And when Jadin came on board and he narrates his story, and I'm saying we actually need this type of role model in the community. A guy who goes to school and does everything without taking a break and is looking after his mother, he's doing everything right, and he's never been to prison for, for criminality. And, this and, and, and those are things we need to start being honest about. Mm -hmm that we cannot be as black people run up and down glorifying prison and glorifying crime. And then we have some billionaires that praise this gangsterism that, and gangsters and so on. And I think that's the wrong direction. Now, um, the one party we haven't mentioned too much, spoken a lot about, and I just want to deal with that, and that's the EFF. Mm. Uh, the EFF seems to uh, get the bulk of the media relative to their size. It's incredible. The polls for the last 10 years have been generous to the EFF and every single time they've underperformed to relative to the polls. Um, yeah, I, I know I, I've said this before and people can challenge me on this. They went down in percentage support from 2019 to 2021. But yet everybody's talking about growth because their, their stadium events are covered from beginning to end by every media house. Do you see them uh, making a strong gain this time? And if so, why? Uh, I think that our predictions, uh, let's say in October last year, compared to now, uh, uh, last year it would have been easy for me to say, I think the EFF can make a gain. And we must also remember that these younger parties, whether it's Songhez or Zibi or, or, or Mashaba or any of these other guys, even the Freedom Front Plus, by the way, these other guys who are growing, and the Freedom Front Plus in my book, they are growing, uh, are growing on account of the failure of the two parties, the ANC and, and the DA. That, that is where this growth, uh, the, the fuel for this growth is coming from, to, to, in, according to me. Now, where the EFF might have a, a difficult time, I'm, I'm not saying they will grow or not grow, but I think they are going to have a difficult time, 
is the emergence of this MK thing. Because what that does is that it muddies the waters for the voters. It muddies the waters for the voters. Uh, I mean, you meet ordinary people, they say uh, Zuma is Zuma of the ANC. Zuma is saving the ANC. You know, so so Zuma has actually ended a, 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 is a cat amongst the pigeons for the politics of the left. Uh, and, and I think it's going to confuse the market even for the EFF, this Zuma factor. Not the ANC of Ramaphosa, the, 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 the ANC of Zuma. I think that is going to be a problem for the EFF. So you don't see them uh, getting to those lofty uh, numbers, even if some people were saying potentially the official opposition? The, for them to get the official opposition uh, to the extent that that matters, it would be a significant collapse of the DA. I, I think that calculation has got to, to involve that. Uh, with all the new parties coming in, I mean, if you look at something small like the ATM, the fact that they can get seats in parliament in the National Assembly uh, and things like that, and then so it's not going to be easy for anybody. The, the biggest parties are not going to grow. And let's say maybe the three biggest parties, if we want to go that route, uh, have got a problem of growth now. And I actually think that this problem of growth is not as significant anymore. What is significant about this problem of growth is for the biggest part, which is the ANC, to lose power, then people understand that a big part is from 15% onwards. Okay. Uh, let's just, uh, in closing, if I have to push you now, we let's say, imagine a world where the ANC does go down to that 40% level. A government needs to be formed within two weeks or so of the election uh, results being announced. What does the next administration of South Africa look like? Who is our president? And who's in the cabinet? You have two options. The first option is if the DA somehow agrees with the ANC veterans to form a coalition, the super, the grand coalition of the, the ANC of Ramaphosa and the DA of whoever. I don't know if they are going to want Stenhazen to be a prominent mm. leader of that. I don't know. I think Stenhazen is a debatable question. Yeah. So that, that would be a grand coalition. Uh, and that would require a bit of selling, hell of a selling job, but it can be done. The one that is uh, apparent is Zuma and crew dictating terms largely to Ramaphosa. There are certain things that they want from Ramaphosa. And they can say, we're bringing these numbers to you, but these are the, the conditions. conditions. These are the conditions. So those are the two possibilities. I don't think the EFF in the current scenario is likely to lead a coalition. Okay, so if you had to put your money then on option one, ANC with a DA coalition. No, I have only got two options. Option two the, is with the, the Zuma I don't lot. think the EFF has got a, a, okay. a, a, a good chance this so, time. Remember, Zuma is opportunistic. Yeah, sure. So I don't think Zuma's first choice is the EFF. If Zuma's thing was thoroughly political. His friendship with the EFF would be automatic. Hmm. Uh, and it's not automatic because there are material benefits that he wants from the ANC. Yes. So uh, the number one uh, possibility is Zuma and Ramaphosa coming back together on negotiated terms. The second one is the DA of whoever. I don't know if it will be Stenhazen. Those are the two options. And which one would you put your money on? Statistically, right now, I would say that Zuma is most likely to get what he wants. But if Zuma gets what he wants, whoever is in that coalition with Zuma and, and the Ramaphosa and whoever is there, they are going to have more problems than the pre two previous administrations. And it seems like um, what you would have is uh, that coalition not lasting five years. I think that's also another uh, possibility. It, it, it's... It's going to be the. It's going to unite the opposition we've seen before. Uh, it's going to unite it. Uh, 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 it will be a very strong opposition to that. And it would be a very rough five years oh. for South Africa. Sandile Swana, thank you so much for your insights. To everybody that's joined us, 
Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. We know we keep tabs on you if you're watching this and you're not subscribed. Subscribe so that you can get the alerts. We've got some wonderful guests lined up. Like Sandy Leswana, you can get your information so that you can make sure that when you go to the polls in 2024, you know what your choices are. Thank you for joining us on the State of the Nation. Subscribe to the channel. If you really like us, become a member and uh, we'll keep you posted with more great content. Thanks, Sandile. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today.